Um, how are you guys? Great. I have one request uh, before I get started. This is a really deep spiritual request. Is uh, my lifelong fandom of one team, my entire life has been the Phoenix Suns, and they play in like 45 minutes against LeBron James and the LA Lakers. I would just ask, just maybe just throw up a prayer. God, for the first time in his career, could LeBron be bad in the playoffs? That's just all I'm asking, that's our prayer, so. If you think about the Phoenix Suns today, just know that that's God's will. Okay, um, no, I'm just kidding. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, now everybody's judging me. Okay, so uh, we're gonna continue on this delight series. I'm going to pray and you don't have to applaud afterwards. And then uh, we're going to jump in. So Holy Spirit, we calm and quiet our hearts and our souls right now in the name of Jesus. I don't wanna talk about God like he's not in the room. One of my, I, I, whenever we come before scripture and come before a message like this, I, I wanna come with reverence in our hearts and ears and, uh, to listen, amen? So Jesus, just, just quietly to yourself, just pray this, just say, God, prepare my heart to receive your word. We honor your word in this place. We honor your presence in this place. We thank you for your presence in this place, your presentness here. Father, I pray that there would be a thin space between this room and heaven right now. That there would be the closest as we can he be to the throne room right now, God, that we would hear your word, would receive it, Father, and rejoice in all that you are. Teach us, God. Just say that to, even pray that to yourself. Just say, God, teach me. We want what you want, God. We want your will, your mind. Touch us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, <laughs> I just thought I heard that. <clears throat> so, title my sermon today, and it's kind of my main point. I, 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 I wanna just talk around this one point today, and it's what you behold, you become. What you behold, you become. Uh, have you ever asked this question? You probably have if you're in your 20s and you've probably stopped asking this question once you're in your 40s because you're like, I don't wanna think about that anymore. Um, but uh, have you ever asked the question of what makes you, you? Who are you? At the taproot of your being, what makes you, you? If I was to introduce you at a party, you would probably say something like, oh, I'm so-and-so, and then somebody would ask the question, what do you, right? Because we tend to identify ourselves by what we do. By, uh, we tend to identify ourselves, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom, or I raise kids, or I work at a factory, or I, you know, professionally root for the Phoenix Suns. You know, like, <laughs> one of those things. What do you do? But at the, at the very basis of who you are as a person, what makes you you? It's not so much what you do, but you'll find, when you really look at it, it's what you desire. You are your desires. The reason you are, uh, in fact, God put all of these desires in us. There are these longings for certain things, longing to be great, desire to be powerful, desire to be uh, loved, desires to be liked, desires to be beautiful. How many of you desire to be beautiful men? Come on, admit it, right? <laughs> Guys that are always like, oh, it's the women that desire to be beautiful. And you'd spend a lot of time with that little beard oil stuff in, in the mirror. We, <laughs> We know what you desire. But we all have these things in us. And, and, and the goal is to direct them to, to, to God. And you see this all throughout scripture. Uh, Psalm 25, verse one, David prays. He says, to you, O Lord, I lift my soul and trust in you. The word lift my soul in Hebrew means I direct my desires. He says it again in Psalm 86. He says, Psalm 86, four, he says, gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. I direct my desires. Psalm 143, verse eight, it says it again. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift my soul. I direct my desires. All of these desires and these longings in us, God put there. 
I think a lot of times we wanna repent these longings away, these desires away, when God actually put them there because they were always meant to be satisfied by him. When I was, uh, when I was uh, younger, I think I was like 21, 22, I was working for this growing, budding ministry in Kansas City, and there were about 50 of us in this little prayer trailer. It was like, you know, those like construction trailers that are on work sites? Somebody had taken and smashed three of them together and knocked out all the walls, and that was our ministry space. <laughs> it had this really thick, bubbly carpet. Like Somebody decided it would be a good idea to put a pad like this under the carpet, so it was like walking on a marshmallow every time you were in the prayer room. Um, but this ministry exploded, right? And uh, overnight, you know, we, we were thinking like 3,000 at a conference and a couple hundred in our ministry, and all of a sudden it was like 25, 30,000 people at our conference and thousands from all over the world joining us. And we were like, what in the world? So when this happened is everybody got a job because we didn't have any money. <laughs> and so it was like, well, to put on a conference for 25,000 people, we all gotta be experts at something. So, you know, we all drew straws of what we were gonna do. And I'm like 22 and I'm now a camera expert. And so I was in charge of the Rover cam on stage. You know, you saw Ryan up here earlier getting all those cool shots, that was me. Horrible decision to make a six foot five gigantic beast of a man, <laughs> the guy that roams around on camera just, you know, like getting the shots. But, uh, <laughs> um, and so I'm up there and then one of my other friends, he uh, got to do like the announcements and be on stage and pray for people and do the ministry time on stage in front of 25,000. I remember I was standing there on the side of the platform going, this is dumb. He's just a dude from Dudesville. I'm just a dude from Dudesville. Like we're all just dumb dudes. Like how does he get to be on stage and I have to hold the camera? And I had this moment where I went, okay, God, you know what, I repent. I, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I repent for my desire to be on the stage. I repent for my desire to be famous or be known. Let me, help me be happy just holding the camera. And, uh, and, and I think the Lord loved that prayer, but I felt like the Lord corrected me a little bit. And the Lord corrected me and he said, Zach, I put the desire in you to be great. He's like, don't repent of your desire to be great. Direct your desire to me. Amen? See, God put these things in us that he wants to satisfy his way, not our way. And in fact, most of broken humanity, humanity is mostly broken, why? Because we have these longings in us for things, but we've nourished them the wrong way. In fact, let, let's, let's look at Psalm 1, because I'm going to base most of my message around this psalm. And, and you'll see in Psalm 1, we're going to read it here in a second, you're going to see... Uh, that there's this metaphor of humans and fruit trees. And it's used all throughout scripture. That in fact, I wanna go this far to say this morning, if I can be so bold, is that I, I think actually God created fruit trees. He invented fruit trees, right? Because he can invent whatever he wants. God is in the heavens, whatever he pleases, he does. I, I think he created fruit trees to testify of how your soul works. I don't think that it's, he uses the metaphor of fruit trees to describe, to describe you. I think he invented fruit trees to already be a perfect example of how your heart works. And you'll see this all throughout scripture. What your root is in is what determines the fruit of your life. Whatever your root is in determines the fruit that you see. We all want to judge and look at everybody's fruit, and we want to judge the fruit in our own life, God wants to look at the root that nourishes it, right? You see this with Jesus. He says, yes, you have heard, do not kill people. That's a good thing, right? Don't kill anybody. Good, everybody good? Today, don't kill anyone. All right, good, see, it's a good sermon. It's one of the 10 commandments. We can walk away now. Um, don't kill people, it's a good thing. Don't do it, it's bad. But Jesus goes, actually, I'm gonna go further than that. If you say, I hate you, Rocco, you fool in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. What is he saying? He's saying, you're, if you have that in your heart, then your tree is being nourished by that, and you're gonna bear bad fruit. It might not be murder, but it's gonna be bad, right? 
He says the same thing about lust. He's like, you heard, you know, don't commit adultery, but if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He's saying the problem is it's not just the fruit, it's what you're rooted in. You see this in John 15. John 15, he says the same thing. I'm gonna read what Jesus said, and it, it pulls on this metaphor, and I'm gonna read Psalm 1 in a second. We're getting there. I'm just, I really wanna tee Psalm 1 up good. Um, so John 15, he says this. He says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that, bear, that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be more fruitful. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I always love John because it always repeats itself so many times. You're like, okay, I get it, abide in me. Uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do Nothing. What's he saying? He's saying unless your roots, if you're a tree, unless your roots are in him, you will not bear good fruit. But if you're nourished by him, what you behold, what you take in, what you direct your desires to, you become. That's the fruit of your life. Paul says it this way in Galatians 5. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, those who walk in the Spirit, he, right before this is the command to walk in the Spirit, he says, those who walk in the Spirit, the fruit that you bear in your life will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against the, no, uh, such things there is no law. What is he saying? He's saying that in your life, God wants to walk with you. You direct your desires in him, and he begins to bear fruits of righteousness in your life. Whenever I put my roots in prayer, I notice myself becoming more patient. Amen? I have a friend who's a, who's a really great guy. I love him to death. But he's, he's a little, he likes himself a lot. He's a little arrogant. He can be very uh, confident in his opinions. I'll say it that way. And, uh, and I've noticed that as he's given himself to a life of prayer, he's so much more yielding to other people and so much more kind and listens as the years have gone on, why? Because he's put his fruits, his roots, and <laughs> root and fruit rhyme, which, by the way, I'm really resisting doing preacher one-liners right now because, like, there's so many great one-liners on this message because if you, if you got bad fruit, you gotta look at the root. Like, there's so many good ones that you can pull from this. When you get two words that rhyme like this in a sermon, man, it's just, like, fodder for some preachers. I'm trying to resist that. But... <laughs> but once you put your roots down and let them be nourished by word and by prayer, you begin to see fruit in your life. So look at Psalm 1. I'm just gonna read it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, we see this again, planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. Uh, they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." This psalm is contrasting two different things, and it, and it causes me to ask two questions. One is, why does the psalmist begin this psalm this way? He says, blessed is the person who does not sit in the seat of, stand in the way of, right? Why doesn't he just say, don't scoff, don't mock, don't sin? Because that would be a lot simpler to say it that way, right? Like, just don't, blessed is the person who doesn't scoff, who doesn't mock, and isn't a sinner. He said, what the difference is, is he's not contrasting good versus evil. He's helping us understand what we're influenced by, right? He's telling us that do not be influenced by scoffers. Do not be influenced by sinners. Do not be influenced by their ways. The question it begs is, what are you influenced by? What are the, what are the streams that your roots are going deep into right now? What are the things in this life right now that you're beholding 
And have you noticed that you're becoming like them? There's so many things right now in our time where I feel like we're all beholding uh, the chaos of our world. And you're watching as people are bearing, seeing the fruit of their roots being in that. You're seeing this anger and vitriol rise up even among Christians where there's this snarkiness about like, you know, our rights as Christians. There's this snarkiness about, about well, we get to because we love God and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, where does that come from? Because I don't feel like that represents the heart of Jesus, right? It's because we're, feeding ourselves on wrong things. I've noticed that if I get cranky and I start to struggle with certain sin issues, the first thing I need to ask myself is not why did I do that, but what's feeding me right now? What am I, what well am I drinking from? And why is it causing me to bear this fruit in my life? Right? It it, it reads that way on purpose. Blessed or happy is the person, he says, whose delight is in this whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And I wanna say something about scripture. I wanna apologize as a pastor to you. I, I, I really, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I feel like pastors and leaders for the last 100 years or so, we've presented theological arguments to our churches. And we've caused you to come to this to try to learn scripture to win an argument. And so for most of us, we come, and all of the questions I get as a pastor are, okay, so -so so-and-so believes this, but this verse says that, so doesn't that mean that we believe this? And And I always wanna pause and go, yes, but that's not the point of scripture. This isn't for arguments. This isn't to prove a point. This isn't to try to convince somebody to be on your side. This is for you to surrender yourself to the God who is and give yourself to him, right? That's what this book is about. I come before this because I'm a dude from Dudesville that knows nothing, right? Like I don't know anything. I've got, in and of itself, I could think I'm really smart, but the only thing that I know is that he is, and I wanna become like him. I wanna lay my life before him. And so delight yourself in the scripture. When was the last time this made you cry? When was the last time you just read this and cried? Maybe when you first got saved, or maybe some of these folks that are getting baptized, they're fresh, you know, you see the fresh Christians that are just, they just are giving their lives to Jesus. When was the last time you read this and it was fresh? Where it wasn't just to win an argument against your Calvinist friend that you don't like, (laughs) right? Or to argue with your Catholic, you know, grandparent (laughs) about why you don't have to take the Eucharist from the priest. You know, like when was the last time you actually just opened this up and you went, God is amazing. There's this phrase in Psalm 34 just this last week that I I read and it just, it makes me cry. I don't know why it's hitting me right now, but it's been hitting my heart in my times of prayer. And it, 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 you know, it's the famous Psalm, you know, taste and see that the Lord is good. But there's this verse I never, I've been in, I've been tearing through this book for eight to 10 hours a day for 20 years. I mean, and I have never read this one verse. And he says, this poor man cried and you answered him and saved him from all of his troubles. And for some reason, the honesty of that verse just caused my heart to just go, oh God, that's me. (laughs) This poor man cried and you answered him and saved him out of all of his troubles. When was the last time you engaged with the word like that? See, this is how we direct our desires to this. We put our roots in this by delighting in it, by marveling at it. Guys, God is amazing. Can we pause and wonder, just, we had never talked about this at Christmas, but dear goodness, God stuck his hands in Mary's womb and formed himself. That's amazing to me. He's like, I'm gonna keep Mary's heart beating while I form myself and I'm gonna birth myself and I'm alive and I'm, Oh, it just, it's amazing to me to think about who God is. Think about Pilate, right? When, when, it, when he stands before him and Pilate goes, what is truth? And he's making Pilate's lungs contract because he upholds all things by the word of his power and he's standing before him and Pilate issues a judgment on him and what the reversal of that is gonna be like one day. Think about the fact that Christianity is not about going to heaven. Did you know that? 
did I just burst a bubble? <laughs> Christi this, this does not say that Christianity is about going to heaven. That's Greek mythology, by the way. The idea, here, let you follow me. Some of you are giving me the weird eye, so I'm gonna explain to you real fast. We have this idea that like, we're gonna get saved, we're gonna die, and then we're gonna go float on a cloud somewhere. That's not in the Bible. We have this idea that there's gonna be St. Peter with a check mark marking your name off as he enters you into the pearly gates. That's mythology. It's not in the Bible. God isn't smite you with lightning bolts. It's not in the Bible, that's Zeus. God, God, you know, God of lightning, God of thunder. It's pretty cool hair though. But the, the, this says this is that there is a relational God who had this relationship within himself called the Trinity and he loved, you, loved the relationship he had so much that he had to create and he created and he formed and he fashioned you. That you are the object of his desire and his whole goal right now is to grow you into becoming like him so he can pull his house called the New, uh, the New Jerusalem down from the atmosphere to join earth together and you're going to be in relationship and dwell with him on this planet for the rest of eternity. Like his plan from Genesis to Revelation, I don't have like the time crunch I did in first service all so I'm, I'm on a long bunny trail right now but hang with me. His, because I love this, <laughs> his plan from Genesis to Revelation is so beautiful. I just have to say this, it's so beautiful from Genesis to Revelation. He forms and fashions Adam, the object of his affection in his image, and he makes Adam in his image and Eve in his image for one reason, so that he can have relationship with him. And it says that he walked with them and delighted them in the cool of the day in the garden. And then what happened? Adam and Eve had a desire in their heart for knowledge and power, and they satisfied it the wrong way. And it broke humanity. See, that longing, they put their root in the wrong stream, and it broke humanity. And you know what God said? I'm never letting my creatures get pulled away from me ever again. I'm gonna create a plan to come back, to die for their sins, to cover them, so that I can be with them forever. That's the story of this book. That's the story of the Bible. Put your root down deep in the narrative of knowing who you are and who he is, and your heart will come alive. Your desires will be satisfied. Your desire to be great, maybe you will in this life, maybe you won't, I don't know, but you're gonna live for a billion years with the almighty God, that's pretty great. You desire beauty, you're gonna to get to explore the cosmos with God forever. Some of you are like, wait, okay, where is this in the Bible? It's all there, it's this amazing book. Anyway, sorry, that's my bunny trail. Let me go back to my sermon. I'm going back, I'm going back. I get excited, like when I start to actually really start to look at scripture, I, my heart starts to go, oh, I wish people knew this story. This story is way bigger than Jesus came, died on the cross because you suck and he made you not suck. Like, I feel like that's what we preach. And it's like way better than that, right? Like, it's like, okay, I'm bad, he died so I could be good and it's over and it's like, oh man, that's like sentence one of a trillion sentences that are about how beautiful and amazing he thinks you are. Man, okay, I'm gonna go back. So, first question, Psalm 1. It asks us, why is it written that way? And it's at, it, the reason why is because he's telling us what we're influenced by matters. Second question I ask when I look at Psalm 1, look at me pulling it all the way back, getting off that long bunny trail. <sighs> Why does in verse three, why does verse three re, uh, say, when you meditate on God's instruction in the Psalms, delight in what you see, then you won't act wickedly, and you won't sin, and you won't scoff. It seems like that, that something along those lines would make way more sense. In other words, that there would be an exchange, right? Don't do this, and this will happen to you. Uh, you know, delight in his word, and you become an amazing person. Like, how come that doesn't just happen, right? It's because the Bible presents God as this for us, we aren't workers that pick fruit, we are trees that bear fruit. And how many of you know there's a process to fruit trees? There's a fall season, right? 
where the leaves fall off. And then there's winter where they go dormant. But that winter portion is very important for the fruit tree and for its health. And then all of a sudden there's what? Spring. And these little flowers begin to bloom. And those flowers and the glucose of those flowers turns into this beautiful fruit. And then summertime, the fruit comes and it starts to blossom until autumn when it's time to pick and the whole process starts over again. There is this process that God loves, even though we hate it. He says, if you will put your roots in this word, I'm gonna walk you now through the process of you bearing fruit and growing into a powerful tree because he wants to walk with you. See, you know why? Because he delights in you. Because you're the object of his affection. Again, if I can convince you of anything, this book says everything he has, as powerful as he is, is directed at you. And all he asks in return is that we direct our desires to him, and then we have synergy. When we direct our hearts and desires back to him, we then have synergy. We're walking with him. So how do we do this? Well. Um, the way that I've learned to behold God so I can become like him is I've, there's these three prayers. I was thinking about how to like do this well. And I just decided, I, I went back to my old journals and I found these prayers that I've been praying for probably three years. And I decided I'm gonna be a little vulnerable this morning. And I just wanna read to you these three prayers. I want you to write them down. I want you to pray these prayers. But I'm gonna read to you some of what I have been praying over my own heart. Because here's what I've learned, is that when I pray these prayers, I get the right perspective. I take me off the throne of my heart, take my emotions off the throne of my heart, I take what I want off the throne of my heart, and I put him in his proper place. And when I put him in his proper place and behold him there, I become like him. Amen? This is how I've been working to put my roots in streams of living water. I pray the first prayer, which is this, is God, keep me from the temptation to be relevant. Keep me from the temptation to be relevant. And I wrote in my journal, this is literally just my journal, this isn't like a sermon I prepared. (laughs) So first time I've ever read my journal publicly, so you're welcome. Um, I wrote, what is the antithesis of that? Making Jesus relevant, that's what I wrote. How can I live in a way that makes Jesus more relevant in a way where I decrease so that he can increase? How can you live in a way, when you pray this prayer, Jesus, keep me from the temptation to be relevant, where you can decrease so that he can increase? Right? And as John the Baptist said that, but he didn't say, uh, I'm going to, I decrease because he increases. He says, I must decrease so that he can increase. How can I make Jesus relevant in my home? How can I make Jesus relevant in my family? How can I make Jesus relevant as a minister? Because I'll tell you this, when you stand up on stages like this, sometimes you, and you'll notice this with other ministers, it can go to your head that you're suddenly relevant and what you have to say matters. And I want to always keep my heart in a place of going, no, he, how do I make him relevant, not me? How do I make his ideas relevant, not mine? How do, how do people walk away from you? Do they walk away talking about Jesus or do they walk away talking about you? Do your kids learn more about Jesus or do they learn more about you? My daughter's in the room, so she might have to answer the, that question. <clears throat> I wrote this, I wrote, Jesus, my prayer is that my identity would be in you, not in what I do. It's a good prayer to pray, right? Father, we pray that our identity would be in you and not what we do. Jesus, give me grace to be less defined by all that I do and be more defined by all that you are. May Jesus be what I'm known for. Help me to be like Jesus. It's the first prayer you can pray. God, help, keep me from the temptation to be relevant. Second prayer is keep me from the temptation to be spectacular. How many of you know we like to be spectacular? I've seen some of you dress, right? (laughs) You walk in and you're like, got you know, you're anyway, whatever. (laughs) I'm not gonna try to be cool. I'm not that cool, I'm not gonna try to be. God, what is it in me that wants to be spectacular is what I wrote. What is it in me that wants to be spectacular and how do I submit it to you? That's what I wrote. 
Pray that prayer. Father, what is it in me that longs to be spectacular, and how do I submit it to you? What does that mean? Spectacular doesn't necessarily mean like big or buoyant. Spectacular can simply mean, am I trying to prove myself to the people around me? Are you trying to prove your worth and your value, or are you trying to prove his? Because here's the amazing thing that happens. Again, when you take your root out of that desire to try to prove yourself, and you put it in him, and let him testify of you, he's gonna make you great. Because he's great, right? Like, do people testify of him in your life or testify about you? Then I wrote this, this is a, (laughs) <laughs> these are, the, these are the, uh, the, the vulnerable parts, but I'll read them anyway because I, because I feel like a lot of us could probably relate to them. I wrote, God, keep me from my need to name drop and flex connections. Somebody? Anyone else? Just me? All right, I suck. Um, no, I'm just kidding. God loves me. Don't, whatever, okay. I'm gonna get an email saying, when you said that, I really wanted you to know that you have, ba-. I know, I get it. It was, it was a bad self-deprecating joke. Um, The need to one-up people's stories. Anybody else? The need to one-up people's stories. The need to make sure everyone knows who I am. The need to prove myself and make myself the victor or the victim wherever the narrative suits me. Someone? Jesus, I confess that as a leader, I have too often desired to be built by my ambition around wanting, and wanting to be and trying to be spectacular. God, give me the grace to highlight you, to think of myself less and others more, that they may see you and not me. God, keep us from the temptation to be spectacular. Think about that as your, not just as a leader in the workplace or a leader in your life, but think about your homes. Do you want your kids later to testify of Jesus and how Jesus raised and grew mom and dad? Or do you want your kids to testify how awesome you were? What's the better narrative for them to have in their hearts? Next, last one, and worship team, you can come on out here, is Father, keep me from the temptation to be powerful. Keep me from the temptation to have it all together. Keep me from the temptation, God, to act like I know what I'm doing. (laughs) You know why? Because it's his will, not my will. It's his kingdom, not our kingdom, right? He says, when you pray, pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. He doesn't say, pray, God, make my will be awesome, make it all work out the way I want it to. Can I help somebody in this room right now? Do you know what anxiety is? Anxiety is pride, it's a form of pride. Do you know what depression is? It's also a form of pride. Both anxiety and depression are a form of pride. One is worried because things won't work out the way they want them to. The other one is disappointed that things didn't work out the way they wanted it to. And here's the thing, nothing works out the way you want it to. And if we're, if we're putting our roots in his streams, our life will work out the way he wants it to. And so we wanna resist the temptation to be powerful because we wanna submit our, our will and our desires and our dreams. I can tell you that the, even just in my 39 years, life has not gone exactly the way that I planned, but when I have submitted myself to his will, I can look back and go, it was probably better though. Amen? When we put, when we behold him, we become like him, let's stand. <clears throat> oh, Jesus, we love you. Would you close your eyes and just hold out your hands? I want two things to happen right now. I don't want my words to be awesome, I want his. Father, would you, and we direct our desires to you right now and we receive your love. Father, we even just declare truth right now that we are loved by our God. We declare truth right now that we are his delight. You delight in us. Father, we submit our will. We submit our dreams, our hopes, our plans. 
And Father, we trust you. I love it how the psalmist in Psalm 25 just says, to you, O Lord, I direct my desires because you, O God, do I trust. I trust you, Father, with everything that's in my heart because you put it there. Every dream in my heart, Father, you put it there and I trust you and I'm gonna stop trying to make it happen. I trust you, God, to do it in me, through me. I direct my desires to you. We're gonna do baptisms here in just a second, which I'm so excited about. I love baptisms. I always cry, my favorite. Before we do this, these ones are gonna dedicate their lives to Jesus officially. Is there anyone in this room that wants to give your life to Jesus? If you are here today and you wanna give your life to Jesus, I just want you to wave your hand at me real quick. Yeah, I see it, I see it. There, yep, I see you over there. It's precious. Would you pray this prayer with me? Father, I repent of my sin. I turn from my ways. I submit my life to you. You are God. I am a man or a woman. (laughs) And I submit my life to you. Take my life, it's yours. Take my will, it's yours. Come be with me, Jesus. I receive your Holy Spirit. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to to hear about it. We'd love to meet with you and talk with you. 